a live online mule and donkey clinic we've done it we've cracked the code and we're bringing questions <laughs> answers to your questions all about mules and donkeys folks my name is dave this here is steve edwards every wednesday we get together for about an hour, about an hour just talking mules and donkeys an answering any questions that you got so you can get back out there gain trust with your animals get results with your training and just quite frankly enjoy the good life of riding and leading and uh and uh owning one of these animals um if this is your first time ever hanging out with us uh, we're really grateful that you're here thank you for spending a few minutes with us uh, we would love to know that you're here so go ahead on facebook uh, on youtube whichever one you're watching go ahead put your name where you're watching from and what the weather is like there and and uh, folks want to know what the weather is like here and uh, let me just tell you you don't want to know it's getting pretty hot although Steve has a new warehouse. I think it was it last year or was it 2018 that your old warehouse blew away? 18. Yeah. 2018, the warehouse blew away. We had just major windstorms. Uh, the monsoons were brutal. And so Steve sends me a message one night. He goes, Dave, um, me and Susan just got done moving everything out of the out of the, the storehouse into the uh, the bunkhouse. Because the shop just blew away, and it's just raining and pouring, and so you got to take care of all the all the equipment, all the saddles, and tack and everything. Well, Steve Dunn got himself a new shop. Steve, how did you build it? Because it's not just it's not not a normal building. No, ain't nothing normal about me. I think yo, <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> you know, when you ride mules, they they used to call you half assed and I say I'm half fast. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway, uh, I took these Connect boxes that are 40 foot long and uh, uh, 10 foot wide, and I put four of them together, and we took and we cut out the inside walls so that we had walls and doors. I put a bathroom in it, and we we sealed it all up. We uh, we even put insulation in it. And, and we put a little air conditioner in it. And I tell you, that is one nice building. And uh, I don't have to worry about the storm blowing these Connex boxes away. We've got them bolted and welded them together. So now I've got a 40 by 40 uh, building that holds all of my saddles in. And now I can put more saddles in. That's you know? right. Yeah, which, which we've got some new saddles coming out. I just got a, I just got a text. Uh, and then I talked to him too from Mark Miller mm -hmm. from Virginia, mm -hmm. and he bought one of those new uh, 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 ultra lights, ultra the all leather, twenty pounds. And he called me. He says, "Mr. Edwards, this is the prettiest saddle I've ever seen." You know, that's awesome. Well, a few weeks ago, oh, so the reason why I brought up uh, the the your shop is because I asked Steve. I said, "Are you enjoying the air conditioning?" Because the old the old warehouse didn't used to have air conditioning. This new yeah, one, he's got a, a, a an office area there where where it does have air conditioning. I says, "Are you enjoying it?" He goes, "Oh no, I haven't even turned it on yet. It's so cool down there." Which anytime you get out there on Queen Valley Mule Ranch, it's always a few degrees cooler out there than it is here in the city. Because of course, you don't have the asphalt, you don't have all the buildings. You just get to feel the air breeze on by, and it is wonderful. Steve, we got a lot of folks hanging out here with us today. Wow. Um, we've got Joy hanging out with us from Queensland, Australia, and you know what that means. We that have means. gone international, right? Oh, yeah. Where is it at? Where is it I at? Got He's a got it. What did I do with it? Where's it? Hey, Noah, I grab me that cowbell. Grab me the cowbell real quick. If you don't, if you don't have the cowbell, I'll get the cowbell for you. I bring. I, I got one. I bring the cowbell to you. Yeah, there we go. There we are. We've gone international cowbell. there. Good to see you, Joy. D is watching. Hi guys. Been enjoying this cooler riding weather here in Camp Verde. Burn, uh, Burnett's watching. Burnett Hillsboro, New Hampshire. Cool and cloudy. Good to have you here. Linda here. Linda, the mule servant, and sweet Theo, the one-eyed. Where, where's the sweet Linda? The sweet one-eyed mule from tornado warning weather in rural central Ohio. Stay safe there, oh. Linda. Keep you and Theo safe. Uh, we've got Sharon and Steve watching. They say hello. Brenda's watching in South Jersey, hot and humid. Ginger's watching. Hi, it's hot and humid in the middle of Georgia today. I can I can just hear the humidity on her voice right there. Sharon's <laughs> watching. She says, hey, Steve, looking good, young fella. Love my, uh, my S.E. Steve Edwards trail light. 
upstate New York in prime riding time. We love hearing that. Red Eagles tuning in, 91 degrees and humid. Sarah Kay is watching South Dakota, sunny in 74. Uh, let's see, Kimberly's watching from Gilbert. Kimberly, good to have you here out in my stomping grounds. All right, the way it works, like I said, put your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather's like. That's the first thing. Number two is ask any and every question you've got. I've got about 10 questions that I bring to every Good. show. And yeah. uh, and then the rest of the questions are filled in by y'all. So put those in the comment section. And the, the third thing that we ask is that you share the broadcast. Uh, just let somebody else know. Just one other person. If you're on YouTube, grab the link at the very top or click the share button if you're on your phone and just send an email or a text message to your friend saying, hey, I think you'd enjoy this. Uh, and if you're on Facebook, just hit the shift and the at key or hit the at symbol, you know, when you're typing an email, steve at muleranch.com. Just do the at symbol and type in their name, click their name, and then say, hey, you need to get over here and watch this. You're going to thank me later. Let them know. So let's get to our first <laughs> question of the day. Red Eagle says, I know you have talked a lot about feed. Right now I feed a max four flakes of first cup per day. He also grazes some grass. I add one small handful of feed for selenium. He eats all hay. Do you think this is too much for him? Don't have a weight, but he's 47 inches high and healthy for now. What would you say? Uh, and he says, uh, he goes on work and walks daily with me for an hour. He also has half an acre to roam. What would you say there to Red Eagle and, well, and his better half, the mule caretaker? The mule caretaker. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how many pounds she's saying. She's talking about flakes of hay, so it could be a variety of things. So uh, I'm not sure how many pounds. So a, a meal of that size right there would probably have uh, six to eight pounds in the morning, six to eight pounds in the evening with that with that one hour walk. And that one hour walk is just that's enough to get them, you know, to keep them exercise. It's better than sitting in the crowds, you know. And then of course if they got that pasture. And he's walking around it. That helps too. But you know, it's it's I you know, always think about how many pounds it's going to be. And really, you know, you really need to know what is in that feed. And that's a big thing I have to try to get across to people. Just because it's hay doesn't mean it's got the zinc it needs to have. It needs the vitamins A. She's doing good with the selenium, okay? Because a lot of hay doesn't have the selenium, and the selenium helps the digestive system really good. So. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's, she's, that's, if she knows. Sounds she like the right direction. Hmm? Sounds like she's headed, uh, Red Eagle sounds like he's headed in the right direction. Yes. Very good. Uh, would you recommend having the grazing muzzle on them if you're going to let them out to pasture? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I've got a new grazing muzzle, um, uh, that we'll be shooting some pictures of, uh, this weekend when we do our videoing. Very good. Yeah, we were supposed to get down to Andrada Ranch a couple weeks ago. Uh, wound up not being able to go. There were a couple things that came up, and so Steve and I are working on getting some time together to go out, uh, do some new videos, taking a lot of the questions that you all ask. Uh, Mule Riders Martingale get a lot of questions about that. Um, so we're gonna do some uh, we're gonna do some good shooting, get you guys some good footage, make uh, make sure you got some good things to do on YouTube here this summer. Uh, let's see here. Next question. Um, this is Sarah Kay. She wants to know who builds your saddles and your tack. I don't share that with anybody. Okay, that's the secret sauce uh, right here's there. Here's what we found: that a couple times years ago, when I did share who did it, they kept calling the people to to build saddles for them. And these saddles are made in America. Uh, they are my trees only. They are my design, and uh, and but they are made in America. There you go. And Steve works with Rainsman uh, for his bits, and uh, and all of the materials that we use, the beta, the leather, it's all top grade stuff. Steve uses the best stuff for his mules, and we yeah. transfer that over there to um, to what we sell on the store. And we get questions all the time 
asking if we do sales or if there's discounts or anything like that. And um, the thing, the, the truth about it is, folks, is that we do our best to get the highest quality materials and offer them at the most affordable price. So there's always there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is we rarely ever have any types of sales, but that's because the good news is is we've put everything at a price that allows us to keep the shop going, keep answering questions, keep staying in business, keep producing amazing tack, but low enough that it's accessible for just about anybody that needs to get it. So if you have any specific questions about how something works, Sarah, please let us know. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's that's the the rundown there of uh, of what we got going on. Myra is watching. Good eye, Steve and Dave. 98 degree, degrees here in Ojai, California. Summer is here. Yes, it is. So glad to have the tools you designed, Steve. I'm smiling just thinking about how well they are working for Grace and me. Thanks. If that don't wet your whistle, I don't know what will. Kimberly says, do I need to wait until my Wyatt is one year old, uh, John Mule Colt, full grown to buy his saddle? Um, I've had people buy saddles before they even bought a mule. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I've had people buy the saddle after they've seen my demonstrations. Well, I'm looking for a meal, but now I got a saddle, so I'll find the meal. You know? That's right. Uh, uh, you know, you can. That just depends on you. You can buy that saddle anytime. Uh, what you don't want to do, folks, is I have a lot of people say that you know I've taken this whole saddle that I had and I just put it on his back. Remember, you're building a foundation for life on this mule. So everything that you do to it—the halter fit, the trimming the feet, the balancing of the teeth—all these things. You want it to, you, that's, this is building foundation for the mule's life. So you want to set a saddle on his back. Don't just put a horse saddle on there, folks. That, that's going to put pressure upon the sixth and seventh rib. And then that mule's going to say, well, hey, why should I trust you? And it's going to go on from there. So, uh, you know, of course, I'm going to sell you a saddle anytime time you say go. But I, I'd wait another year anyway, because you really don't need to put a saddle on a mule until he's about, ah, about two years old, roughly. One of the benefits of the way that Steve, and he'd tell you this, um, the way he designed the saddle is folks will say, well, you know, I want to have a custom saddle designed to fit my animal. I want it to fit perfectly. And Steve has just informed me that th there's two reasons. Well, there's many, but there's two main reasons uh, why why you want to reconsider that. Number one is when you measure the mule, it's going to be different in the summertime than it's going to be different than it is in the wintertime. You're talking about fat versus hard working. And so if you measure it to fit in the summertime, it's going to fit differently than in the wintertime and vice versa. And then the other reason um, is because when that mule passes away and it's been designed down to the millimeter to fit them, um, whether it's the summer or the winter, you no longer have a saddle that's going to be usable. You, you have to say, you know what, man, glad old Fluffy was with me. Let's find a new Fluffy and build a new saddle. So really the saddle is made to fit the bone structure. And I just put in the comment section a link to our mule saddle training course. And what you will learn in this mule saddle training course is not just why the saddle that fits on the back of the mule has to be made and built uniquely, which those are Steve's bars on there but how all of the tack and everything works together. Um, a lot of folks will say, I've got your saddle, I've got your pad, I can't figure out you know, why he's, he's continuing to do this or do that. Well, then we'll take a look and it's because there's a pulling collar on there. And so the, the mule keeps walking, pulling the saddle forward ev with every step. And then eventually you're up on top of the scapula and he's trying to tell you that he's in pain. So check out uh, that mule saddle training course. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic um, it's going to be a fantastic resource for y'all. I actually think I put the wrong link. Let me get the right link in there right now. And, and the other thing, Dave, is... Yeah, go for it. You realize that when you go on a trail ride, these animals can drop 100 pounds in a weekend. And so what we used to do was add more pads to make up for that loss of, of muscle mass, you know, and, and loss of, of water weight and stuff. Well, when we add another pad, guess what happens? We have to tighten the cinches tighter because now we take the bar, which should be sitting on their back. We now have to take the bar away. And now we have to tighten the cinches tighter. Mm -hmm. So the saddle is going to roll. And, and that's another thing you got to consider. So, you know, the, those pack saddles are what made the difference in how I learned to keep a saddle into place. That made a really made a good deal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
Uh, Kimberly, thank you so much for the question. She says, can I touch and feel the saddles anywhere? Uh, Steve does some clinics and expos throughout the United States uh, uh, several times a year. So if he's at any event, sometimes he'll have uh, equipment and tack with him. Sometimes he won't. Uh, and then we'll be doing some clinics at the ranch um, maybe towards the tail end of this year, beginning of next year. We'll have to see how things go with this COVID-19. Uh, that's going to be the best place other than that, finding somebody in your community. So maybe Kimberly, if you want to hop over on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash mule ranch and, uh, and see if there's some folks out there around where you live. More and more and more folks are learning to respect the mule or the donkey, which means they're finding their way around some of the things we're talking about here. And you'll find some folks that have a Steve Edwards saddle. Mark Miller just chimed in. I received the new ultralight saddle today. I am very happy with it and such great service. Service. Fluffy is going to love it, and so will I. It will be a big help after back surgery. Y'all take care. Mark, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for saying that. I took a screenshot, Mark. Hopefully you'll be okay with me sharing that when some folks are wondering, is this ultralight worth it? We'll say, well, Mark Miller says it is. Kimberly says, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome, Kimberly. Let's hop back over on Facebook. Uh, Dee's here. Burnett's here. Uh, Sharon's here. Uh, Sharon Williams is here. Hey, Steve, looking good. Uh, let's hey, see. I mentioned Sharon Williams. Yeah. Is this the same Sharon Williams? She she emailed me. She found one of my saddles used. Oh. And and which was which is a great deal. It's a rare find, yeah. Yeah, and she put it on her mule, and and she says the, my mule immediately dropped his head, relaxed, and went down the trail super. She says, I'm sold. She says, That's awesome. that saddle changed my mule that quick. Now, that doesn't always happen, yeah. but it's really great. Number one, she was able to find one of my saddles. But number two, wow, the mule changed. And she also said, and this happens all the time, it's, it's tough. People made some changes in my saddle. They put billets on it. And she mm -hmm. says, I knew that didn't need it to be. So I pull those off and I put your cinches on. Mm -hmm. and I ordered some cinches. But she says, Steve, this saddle's awesome. Now, and congratulations, Sharon. Well done. Well done. Uh, Dye's here. Dave and Dye in Queensland, overcast 68 Fahrenheit. Thank you for making the transition for us there from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Appreciate you guys. It's good to see you. They've taken us international again. Linda's here. Theo is still sweet. She says, my fingers must be tired. <laughs> but you know what, Linda? It's so good to have you here week in, week out. Uh, we are getting to know you and Theo through the magic of Facebook. Karen's watching. She says, watching from Central Virginia enjoying a nice needed shower of rain uh, send it our way please yes. my question is what should i do when my mule lips lips my clothes or tries to chew my mm. shoes steve you want to just get them out of there right talk to us absolutely yeah they're you know they're kind of trying to be nice a little bit and when when you see two mules they're kind of uh, on each other's neck and they're kind of lipping it and, and this sort of thing and kind of kind of biting it's a nice way they're saying, hey, I like being around you, but you and I don't like to be bit. And they don't, they don't think nothing about it. It's a back rub for them to be biting on each other's neck. So, you know, kick them in the shin, use the edge of your boot, kick them in the shin, and when they step out of your space, you step into their space. Always remember, you're allowed to go into their space, they're not allowed to come into yours. And like I said, the mule saying, hey, I like you, but the downside is that it can hurt when they really get serious. We talked about it last week, and Steve, I think I remember you saying, you know, as much fun as it is, they're not dogs, they're not cats. These are not, you know, domesticated animals that we have running around inside. And so, you know, you give them an inch when they're younger, they kind of learn that behavior. Um, so you want to you want to do that hard work as difficult as you want to do that hard work as soon as it comes around so you can nip it in the butt. Uh, Neil's here, Neil and Abby from Peshtigo, Wisconsin, 70 degrees and raining. Send the rain to Arizona, please. Gary's here, uh, Boudreaux from Louisiana, 85 degrees. You know what? He had some comments over on YouTube. Thanks for watching watching our videos on YouTube. Really appreciate you spending some time with us, Boudreaux. Um, let's see. Richard Matthews, Morton Chaplin. Steve Richard is a staple here. He's coming in at the front end. A lot of times he comes in towards the tail end, so we're glad that you're here, Captain. Yeah, that's uh, Captain Richard. Captain He's Richard. Awesome. 
Re Rebecca's here. Hello, Steve and Dave. Very hot and humid here in North Carolina. Kathy's watching. Hi, Steve and Dave. It's Kathy from Cotati, California. Today's another hot day, 90 degrees. Linda says, saddle builder equals family recipe. That's right. Thank you very much, Linda. I took the words right out of Steve's mouth. Uh, Nikki says, another North Carolina and tuning in. Glad to have you here, Nikki. Doreen is, man, a lot of friends here. Doreen is here saying hello. Cowboy Ken from Connecticut's watching. Dan from East Texas, sunny in 88. Jessamy is watching from, uh, let's see, uh, Northwestern Oregon, sunny in 76. And uh, Alexia from Wisconsin is watching. Let's get to our next question. This one's about a McClellan saddle. We get a question about a McClellan saddle here every now and again. David wrote on YouTube, thank you for sharing your knowledge. I was wondering how would a McClellan saddle, saddle work on a mule in your opinion? Both front, both back and front, both back front and back cinches are connected to the girth that sits quite central. Do you think it could be a good alternative choice? Okay, so your your McClellan mule saddle has a brass horn. If it does not have a brass horn, it is not the McClellan mule saddle. Now, the also the McClellan mule saddle with a brass horn, they use a back cinch on it, as well as the front cinch. Now, here's the downside, is that McClellan saddle was designed for a mule 60 years ago, 70 years ago. I don't know how old the, the saddle is, but you gotta think about it. These new mules are different. They're, they're bred different. They're bred to a different type of horse. They have a different type of jack. Uh, they did a lot of Catalonian breeding back then uh, and some mammoth. So if it doesn't have a brass horn, boom, just leave it alone. If it doesn't have two rear cinches, leave it alone. Now, it should also have a uh, two uh, rings on the back of the uh, uh, tree that we can put the breaching as well. Now, I've I used to ride a McClellan years ago uh, with a brass horn, but again, I kept having problems with my mule. He kept shaking his head going downhill. <clears throat> he kept stepping away from me uh, and just different things over the years. So, I mean, over the time frame. So I finally, you know, quit using it. Uh, but it has to have a brass horn. That's number one. Very good. Uh, let's see here. Next question that we got. We got lots of really good questions today. This one's coming from Cindy. She also left a comment on one of our previous YouTube live streams. She says, my mule pulls away, especially coming off the trailer. How do I stop this habit? Groundwork, groundwork, groundwork. Come along hitch is where it has to start. Uh, another thing, see, she's saying I want to hurry up and get out of there. So maybe she may even be pawing to start with. But see, what this mule is, Dave, and we've seen so much of this, they do not have any respect for that halter, you know? And most halters are not adjusted correctly. So an ill-adjusted trailer uh, halter, uh, and I use my rope halters for everything. I do not use a nylon or a leather halter. So a, a, a properly adjusted halter, but go back, do ground foundation before she hurts you. Okay, now I, I got people that have got, uh, have had a, a broken fingers uh, from the animal jerking them around. I've had people, you know, bumped and knocked over and this sort of thing, mainly because there's no respect for that halter. So uh, ground foundation is where I would start. Very good. Uh, let's see. The next question I got, we'll just pump them out here pretty quickly. Uh, Laura sent in an email. She says, hi, I'm in Ontario, Canada, and I purchased my first mule who will be delivered from Ohio soon. Congratulations and welcome to the family. He's 14 yeah. hands high and kind of thin framed. Will your tree fit all sized mules and do you ship to Canada? And I can answer that one. We do ship to Canada, but Steve, will the tree fit this mule right here will it fit all mules yeah absolutely dave one of the things she needs to do is look at that uh saddle fit uh, uh program that we have that free one and and then she will see uh what 10 or 12 different size mules thin mules wide mules 
uh, my, my favorite one, the 13-2 mule up to a 17-hand mule. And you'll see the tree go from mule to mule to mule to mule. Uh, again, we go back to, all right, let's make a custom saddle uh, tree for this mule. And folks, listen, it is not just the tree. It's how the skirting is made around the tree. It's how the rings are placed. Those are all a big major part of it. Uh, I have people all the time say they bought this mule saddle or that saddle. And I say to them, number one, does it have billets on it? Is the back of the saddle closed? Uh, I just had a guy call me the other day and uh, he, was, he was using my saddle, and, but he was using a tail crouper. He said, Steve, I'm wearing a hole on the three bones in the back. And I said, yes, send me a picture. Sure enough, he was using a wool felt pad that was closed in the back, so it was rubbing. Plus, he was using a tail crouper, which was sucking down on it, and it rubbed the back of the bone. He could have developed a fistula. So I'm hoping I'll spend some time with him this weekend and, and show him a couple of things. So uh, one of the things that we probably don't talk about as much as we should, we hear comments from folks sharing about, let's, a matter of fact, let's do this right now. If you are watching and you own a Steve Edwards saddle that you're happy with, that it has worked out just the way that you were hoping it would, um, put in the comment section what saddle you're riding and the size of your animal, the size of your mule. We don't do this very often. We get a lot of folks yeah. talking about how um, how it fits well and how they're amazed at uh, at just the difference that they see. But we don't really talk much about what was the size of their mule. So if you are watching right now and uh, and you're using Steve's saddle, go ahead and put in there what saddle you're riding and what the size of your animal is. And let's just give Laura. Uh, a little bit of proof here. Look, Steve and I can talk about it all day long, but let's just give her a little bit of confidence to know that there's folks out there who are riding the saddles with animals of all different sizes. So if you are riding one of Steve's saddles, um, put in the comment section right now uh, the the saddle that you're riding and the height, the size uh, of your animal, and uh, and let's 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 help Laura there. Uh, let's keep moving on here. Uh, Cordura, idea. yeah, Cordura Fenders. Terry emailed in, and we talked about this last week. And I actually meant to ask the question, and I forgot. I just bought a trail light saddle and was watching Steve talking about twisting the fenders to make the stirrup stay in the forward position. So I wanted to know if the Cordura, Cordura fenders will hold the twist like leather fenders will, uh, like on the leather saddle. Steve, uh, we've used the Cordura on the trail light saddle. Do we need to treat those fenders the same way? Yeah, you do twist them up. The leather, you don't twist them as much, but the Cordura, you twist them right down. Now. If you look at a lot of my videos, you'll see my Cordura saddle, and you'll see how the fenders lay correct and the stirrups are correct as well. And if you go over to the to my website uh, where the Cordura saddle is sold, you'll see some pictures of my uh, trail light saddle when I, uh, as I've been using it over the years for the past 15 years. And you'll see I've got tapaderos on it. I've got a, a night latch on it. I wrap the horn for roping, and but you can see where the stirrups are pointing correctly. Very good. Uh, yeah, we talked about that last week, showed some pictures, and I was thinking to myself, I was like, man, do you do the Cordura the same way that you would do the 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 fenders that come on the cowboy saddle, the trail rider saddle. So that's very helpful. Um, appreciate that question. Uh, next question here, this one's about livestock. And Melissa sent this in, says, thanks so much for answering my question about using a mule for posse search and rescue work. That was from last week. Another question is this, you said never put a mule in with goats or sheep, but I've read that donkeys make great livestock guardians. Why are mules being half donkey? Not a good choice. I'm so excited to have received the ground foundation starter kit and videos my husband and i really enjoy watching and god willing we'll have a good mule one day so that we can apply all we're learning what would you have to say to melissa well it's just i if that horse combination with the with the donkey is the only thing that i can say as to why i've seen donkey uh, uh livestock protectors uh they they do a good job I have seen some donkey jacks uh, kill sheep 
uh, kill donkeys, uh, you know, and this sort of thing. But they're jacks, and they're usually pretty mean. Um, but you use those mini donkeys, and they do just fine. But that, I guarantee you, uh, you, you, that mule will kill uh, donkeys, and I mean, uh, uh, sheep, and this sort of thing. And I tell you, I think, I think it's the predator mentality because you know, even with dogs, they'll try to paw dogs. And try to get them, but sheep and and goats, they just kind of lay there and say, "Kill me," you know. Uh, they're just that dumb; they'll do that. But unfortunately, I, I don't really have a complete reason for you. I've just seen it happen, and it's not a pretty thing. Yeah, um, we've had people comment on these shows over there. We've got close to seventy episodes now, and from time to time, folks will come in and they'll share, you know, the same sentiment there. So, good question. Thanks for asking it, and glad we can uh, give you an answer there. Uh, let's see here. Over on Facebook, uh, I believe we got a question from Beth. Yes, Beth sent in a message. It says, my mammoth donkey will lope or canter, but only about one time around the ring. After that, he will only trot. If I force him to canter more, will I be causing him to become angry and revolt in some way? So first, Steve, I don't know what lope or cantering is. And so she's saying my mammoth donkey will lope or canter, but only one time around the ring. So what is that? And then is she going to be causing problems if she forces it? Okay, so what a canter is, it's when you're going on the proper lead. So you're going on the left lead, going out. And it's a very fast, best way to say it, it's a very fast walk. But it's very collected. The animal's back is rounded out. His head is balanced and framed up. And it's a really nice, very fast uh, way for the animal to go. And it's very quick. So what you have to do is you've got to build the confidence of the donkey. Uh, yes, making, you know, when I first start my donkeys and cantering, I'll canter maybe a quarter circle. I'll stop. I'll get off. I'll loosen the cinches. I'll shake the saddle up and down. I'll give them a good scratch. I'll turn them, point them the opposite direction. I'll cinch things back up, and then I'll go and I'll go another quarter uh, circle, and then I'll get off, give them a scratch, loosen up the cinches, let them relax, and this sort of thing. And it'll and and that's how I do it. So now, as I progress, I do a full circle, and when I do a full circle, I don't get off at the gate now. Don't do that. Get off separate place other than the gate, because if you get off at the gate, they think they're going out. So, uh, and then make sure you're loping big circles. Don't lope in a 60 foot round pin, uh, because it's too tough on their tendons and this sort of thing. So, rope out and lope out in the arena with a good area. But that's how I build their confidence: is I'll lope and then I'll get off and I'll loose up the cinches, and I do it three, six, nine, twelve. Same way as I do anything else, building a foundation. But uh, uh, also make sure you're using spurs, okay? And it's really important. And the other thing is this, uh, don't try to make them stay in the circle. Lope on a loose reins, loose and quiet. You're gonna be riding in a snapple bit. Uh, so that way you can balance and frame them out. And, and when they go to suck out and try to go toward the gate, you stop them turn them, go across the circle, and start your circle again. So they're loping a nice circle. As long as they don't fade out, usually they'll fade out in two places. One, where other animals are, two, toward the gate. And they'll, they'll fade out those places. But what people tend to do is they tend to hold the inside rein and, and use the outside leg to make them keep staying in a circle. Don't do that. If you'll do that, if you pull on the inside rein, and then with the outside leg, it'll make them run through their shoulder. And they already know how to run through their shoulder, but now they'll run faster. So what you do is you'll open your circle, you will open nice little quiet lope, and all of a sudden you feel them sucking out. You stop them, pick up on the reins, direction of pulsion, take them across the center of the circle. In other words, you make that spot where they want to leak out, you make that un uh, uncomfortable for them. Very good. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. It's funny. 
Uh, just as uh, just as you started answering my question about uh, Lope and Canner, uh, Kathleen, who is uh, the the other half of Red Eagle, said, "Dave, getting those definitions in." What? So I said, "I got you, Kathleen. I got you." She wants to know everything she can, and I applaud that. Uh, let's see here. Trace is watching. Hey guys, glad to be here from Lowood, Queensland, Australia. Flat battery in the UTE. So here I am, early for once, taking us international once again. We're glad you're here trace thanks for hanging out with us a little bit um let's see kathleen says howdy boys red eagles other side speaking of the other side he talked of feed i'll speak of well poop we try to keep abner's pasture clean and void of pa uh, parasites but even great dane dog scoopers are not well constructed also should one want to compost thoughts i could google but what's the fun in that? And on a side note, I thought yesterday was Wednesday and was so sad when I realized it was not because I was living for the social interaction besides Red Eagle, no <laughs> offense, lovely, that I can have on this page since March. P.S. Hades hot in Syracuse, New York. All right. So we're talking about poop. Um, even a Great Dane size scoop doesn't work. Steve, what would you say is just a good solution here to keep things clean, clear of parasites? Well, it's going to be next to impossible because the problem is you got bird poop out there, you got snake poop, you got rat poop. You are not going to be keeping it clean of parasites. Uh, and I tell you, folks, pastures are just like uh, smorgasbords. Uh, you can overfill yourself and you can make yourself sick as well. And so can your mules and donkeys. Um, so going back to this compost, 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 I've been composting for 25 years. Susan's got an awesome garden. We planted about 60 trees on the ranch and we used nothing but mule road apples. It works good. Uh, don't worry about picking up after the, the donkey for parasites. Go ahead and use the manure uh, for, uh, uh, for your composting. You can also do like I have done in the past is I put a drag behind my quad and I drag around and that takes that that manure out through the pastures and 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 it helps it out a little bit and by the way i don't turn my mules out on a pasture but rarely this don't I, here's here's something for you yeah why do i turn them out on the pasture hmm. because it's full of choya cactus and other cactus and they have to move around there's not much grass but they have to get cactus in them and they start getting get getting get a feel for it and it makes a big difference very little to eat but they get out there in that quote desert pasture, and uh, and they they get bit by cactus. <laughs> Just start learning. That's right. Uh, let's see here, Linda. Hopefully that helps you there, Kathleen. Uh, Linda says, in my humble opinion, no matter what animal may be content under a McClellan saddle, no human backside is happy on top of <laughs> on top <No>. of one. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right. It is. You got to remember those seats. Now I have rarely seen. A seat over 16 inches. You got to remember, it was a lot of young guys that were in these saddles. They were 14, 15, 16 years old, uh, an awful lot of the time. It wasn't the men that we see in these in these videos, but and they were also smaller guys as well, you know. Uh, but uh, you're right. A McClellan saddle is extremely uncomfortable, uh, and and uh, yeah. Very good. Yeah, Not it sounds like it sounds like it takes takes one who's ridden to no one uh, who's ridden. Yeah. All right, let's keep looking here. Okay. Uh, all right, Aaron's got a question. I saw this earlier. Hey, gents from Minneapolis. Hope you're staying safe there, Aaron. Wondering why you don't see more donkeys doing field work. Is it a size thing? Is it an endurance thing? Is it something else? Good question. Never had that question. Steve, why don't we see more donkeys doing field work? Field work, in other words, pulling a plow and this sort of thing. Uh, when you go to uh, uh, Israel or you go to um, uh, I Egypt, I have seen them doing some field work, but mainly because they don't have the muscle, the hind quarter. They can't do much of it uh, because they don't have it. Uh, and, and, and that muscle is really important, the Gaskin muscle down on the leg, and a good muscle hind end, and so they really don't have it. And it takes a lot of them to be able to pull a plow. Compared to two mules, it would take six donkeys uh, that would, you know, that could possibly do it. But 
uh, yeah, you, I've seen them in Israel be used, them, used and in Egypt I've seen them be used. Uh, and they were also not very big. They, you know, they were they were miniatures. You know, very good. Uh, David Pingelli. So this will be a little bit of fun. Uh, folks are sending in what size uh, their animal is riding one of Steve's saddles. So this is David Pingelli, hot and rainy in Sonoya, Georgia. I have two of Steve's saddles, Trail Light and the new Ultra Light. Love both, and they are interchanged between my two mules, fourteen two, and the other is thirteen two. Both are fantastic. Uh, Karen says, my husband and I both have your trail light sad saddles. My mule is 14.1. My husband's is 15. Uh, Di uh, says, we have the trail light and cowboy saddles. Absolutely happy with them and your tack and pads. Used on a 12 hands high donkey up to a 17 hands high Belgian. So there you go, Laura. That's some good stuff right there. D says, trail light for me for my 56 inch donkey. Comfortable for her and me for the first ride. I did put stirrup turners on and bucking rolls just because I like them. Very good, D. Uh, so thank you guys for sharing that. That's very helpful. Um, Jack says, Jack from Johannesburg is watching 16-inch trail light saddle. Uh, four years, no issues. Pad, britchin, breast collar, all tack from Steve. We love it, Jack. Thank you so much. Appreciate you sharing. Um, let's see here. Uh, I had a question. Marnie's here. Marnie says, I heard you make a comment that you should not lunge a mule. Could you elaborate on that? And because Kathleen is still watching, Steve, tell me what lunging is, and okay. then tell me why we don't want to. All right, so lunging is they have the lead rope in their left hand, and it's a long rope. It's usually about, that can be up to 20 foot long, and it's attached to the halter. And then they take a lunge whip which is a whip that's roughly about six foot tall with a long uh, snapping popper on it that's usually about four foot long. And so as they're going around, they're using their uh, lead rope to hold them into place and they're using the lunch whip to get them to go around. The problem is this, when you're doing that, you've got all that leverage of that lead rope and you're pulling on their nose. And when you pull on their nose, their shoulder is going to go out away from you and you help improve the strength in their neck and you teach them it's okay to run through their shoulder. I prefer just to use a surf single only to balance them to get them framed up and, and this sort of thing. That's what I use. I don't use a surf single to warm them up. I, I, I mean a, uh, a lunch rope to warm them up. I, uh, if I'm going to do any type of lunging at all, it's going to be in a round pin free so they're going to be going free so the reason i don't do it is it teaches them bad habits of running through their shoulder one of the things that you'll hear steve say a lot especially if uh, if you're new to this which by the way if this is your first time watching or first time in a long time want to just say welcome to all of our friends who watch week in and week out we are so glad you're here my name's dave this is steve edwards steve's been working with mules cowboying all his life working with mules since the early 80s and teaching folks uh, how to just enjoy their mule and get results in their training since the early 90s. Every week we talk for about an hour about mules and donkeys, and there is a lot to talk about. One of the things that you'll hear Steve say a lot is that uh, you may fix one problem with something you do, but down the line, may not be a week, may not be a month, may not be six months, maybe even more than a year, you will find that there are new problems and the reason he knows is because he's experienced them. You fix one thing, but then two, three new problems develop down the road, and you might even not know that they're connected to the one change that you made. So really where the a lot of these um, uh, preferences come from is not so much just preference, but it's, no, I'll tell you what happened time and time again. We made the change, and it didn't happen anymore. So when we're talking about things like that, just... Uh, differences in the way people might uh, train. Steve's just going to share with you everything that he's learned from the mule, the donkey, and his experience owning one, and uh, put those tools in your hands. Uh, let's see here. Linda says, Linda, I have the trail light saddle, 15 inch. Theo is a 15-3 mammoth quarter horse mule with very pointed withers. So thank you for sharing that, Linda. Appreciate it. Trey says, uh, have a cowboy saddle for two of my mules, different sizes, 13-2 and 14. Wanted to get it right from the start very informative website on gear especially from uh u.s aussies who live miles away 
um, jealous of the U.S. residents who would it would be so easy to order for. So thank you for that there, uh, Trace. Appreciate that vote of confidence. Uh, Jessamy asked the question, I rescued a little molly mule from a feed lot and she is wild. Sounds like my three-year-old Stevie. I've been working with her for the past couple of weeks using a come-along rope and using the ask-tell-demand method. Good for you, Jessamy. I have never trained a mule before. My question is, how, which good for you getting out there and training and being bold and strong yeah. and making making that jump. That's good. Good for you. I've never trained a mule before. My question is, how long or short should I keep my – oh, good question. How long or short should I keep my sessions with her? She seems to be taking everything in like a sponge, and I want to keep the experience positive for the both of us. Such a good question. Steve, what would you yep. say to Jessamy? Okay, number one is anytime you build on a foundation, it's going to be over a six month time frame, training four to six hours a week. That's all. Now, your training sessions should depend on what you're doing in your training. All right. So let's just say we're taking the mule and we're going to go over a tarp. The first time the mule comes, he's worried, his head's in the air, and but he goes across the tarp. The second time the mule comes over, well, he's still kind of worried, but he goes over the tarp a little bit easier. The third time he goes over, the head's down, he's more relaxed, goes over the tarp, quit, quit. You've done your three for the day. The problem is, is once we do something and he does it right, we do it a lot of times. Don't do that. Do it over a three, six, nine, twelve time frame. So on Monday, I'm going to do it three times. I'm going to go across the tarp. This is just an example. There's a lot of other training features. So on uh, on Wednesday, I'm going to go over that tarp, those three, and he's going to go over it nice and quiet, comfortable. All right, I'm going to add three more. Now I've done six. Now I'm done for that Wednesday. Now comes Friday, maybe Saturday. And I go over and I do those six. He does it really smooth, really easy. Then I do nine over it, okay? But don't keep going if they don't get it right and are nice and quiet. Always think about this. Head down, relaxed, eye quiet. Yet the head is elevated. They're tightening all five ma major neck muscles, and they're really uncomfortable about a situation. So there you go. Uh, that's a, a general thought. Uh, you can also, my ground communication uh, video and and kit it'd be a wonderful tool for her uh, a lot of people Dave buy just the halter or just the come along hitch and really you need to have those stages they need to see how I'm using that come along not just in a couple YouTube videos but how I'm using it with another cowboy a buckaroo and how we're using it on a on kind of a, a, a bronchi mule yeah, all those tools work together, and in a lot of videos you'll see on YouTube, uh, you'll see Steve progress from using the come-along rope to the rope halter, and then you know mule riders martingale or bridle or whatever the or whatever the case might be. But you'll see that progression, and uh, and then you'll see Steve go back all the way back to the come-along rope uh, to begin doing some corrective work or some tune-ups. And then as soon as the mule demonstrates, hey, we're good on this, then he'll begin the progression all over again. So um, great question there, uh, Jessamy. Um, love the thought that you've got. Uh, one, getting out there and doing it on your own. Number two, um, wanting to know how much to train. That's It's kind of a, a counterintuitive thing. Folks think, man, you got to get out there and you really got to bust your tail. Um, the mules are just a lot different than a lot of other animals out there. And, uh, and so good for you for asking. Marnie asks... What's your best recommendation to build the hindquarters on a mule and how often? Why would I want to build the hindquarters? And I'm assuming those that's the rear hip, the rear legs yep. area. Why would I want to build that? We want to build that because that's your motor. That right there is what drives the mule forward. Head down, back rounded out, drives them forward. So uh, my favorite thing is a sur single. Put them in a sur single. Folks, when their head is up, they're hollowing out their back and they're pulling with their front end and moving off their back end. That's not building on the hindquarters. When their head is down, they're framed up, their nose is on the vertical, that makes them round out their back. That makes that, that hindquarters push. That's what strengthens them. Then, 
my other thing, my favorite thing is, is put them in the wagon. Man, put them in the wagon and drive in the wagon. That really builds good hindquarters. And then the other thing is go up and down mountains. You know, spend a lot of time climbing up a mountain and down. But my favorite thing to do to start building them to it is put the, put the rope halter on that's adjusted, put the surcingle on, put your breaching on, and hook the surcingle to the halter, and then turn them loose and let them drive themselves. Now, you can also do things like uh, take a, uh, that surcingle, and you can also tie some, some twi bailing twine to it and put a 14 inch tire on the back and have them pull that tire and in that sand and that does really good very good great question uh over on youtube we got a few more folks watching we've got saber watching steve are you coming to the east coast for a clinic this year or next right now as far as i know steve we don't have anything on the calendar that's not to say that we won't. So, uh, Sabra, the best way, and for everybody watching, if you have an event in your area, Steve can call all day long and say, hey, I want to present. Hey, I want to present. I'd love to be there. And they'll just hang up. They'll just hang up. The people that they listen to are you. So if they know that there are folks out there who are looking to have certain clinicians come in and present and, uh, and host sessions, they want to hear from you. So if there's some events... Go ahead, call the event organizers. They really want to hear from you. And you tell them, you say, Steve Edwards out of Queen Valley, Arizona, needs to be at this event to do a mule and donkey session. And uh, we've gotten Steve into clinics before doing just that. Matter of fact, the Hoosier Festival, usually they never invite somebody to come back two years in a row. But because of y'all, Steve came back two years in a row because folks said, no, we need to have mules and donkeys represented. And they brought Steve back out for a second year in a row. So they really do listen to y'all. So Sabra and everybody else, if you've got an event and you want Steve to be a part of it, you need to call the event organizers because one call from you does way more good than 10 calls from us. And that really is the truth. Uh, Mark Miller is watching, said, ultra light and the cowboy on my 15 hands, both are fine crafted. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. David's watching from Port Angeles, David Cantors. Uh, Estrella, hi from Western Colorado. Good to have you here, Estrella. Uh, David says, watching from Port Angeles, Washington. Cloudy and cool today. Very good. Uh, Sabra says, South Carolina, scattered showers and 81 degrees. Sounds nice. Red Eagle says, hey, again, Abner is 620 pounds using heart girth method 59. He stands 47, uh, five high at Withers, so just shy of 12 hands. What weight would be okay for riders riding him and which saddle? Well, the trail light saddle is one of, it's what really works great for a lot of folks, especially with donkeys. Uh, and then, you know, that size of a, a size of a donkey, it just really depends on how much you're going to be riding. If you're just going to be going out on a little simple one hour ride, you know, pretty flat ground, uh, you can do just fine. I've seen some pretty good sized people sitting on those donkeys and those donkeys do a good job but let me tell you something about a donkey if he feels that he can't do it he'll lay down they literally just lay down and say nah ain't gonna happen uh no way in the world i've seen that several times over in egypt where donkeys were pulling carts and it was just too much weight too much for them to do they just laid right down yeah Very good. Very good. Uh, let's see. Yolanda's here, so that means we've gone international once again. Yolanda keeping the mule and donkey equine community alive and well in the Netherlands. Steve, I'm yeah. still waiting on the pictures of the custom-made bits. Uh, I sent them. Did you send them? All right. Yolanda, yes. did you text them or email them or Facebook I messenger? I emailed them this morning. All right. And, uh, and uh, see, that was about 9 o'clock this morning. I sent her two pictures. All right. Hopefully those emails didn't get caught up in customs like some of the packages that USPS sends there. Let's hope those emails made it straight there. Uh, so Yolanda, we're glad that you're here. We'll keep chatting on the uh, on the Facebook there. Uh, Mary says, howdy, Arkansas, 82 degrees. We're glad you're here, Mary. Marnie's uh, replying to asking about the hindquarters. Great. I will work on that. Head down is a good point, and I just happen to have a spare tire he can pull. Very good. Eileen's here. Eileen's watching from Nebraska. She says she's doing well, looking at a few Jake Clark auction mules. We will see what happens. Smoking needs a different partner. Hard choice to make letting him go. So, Eileen, yep. keep us yep. in the loop. Keep us in the loop. Uh, Linda yeah, says, I, I don't... Eileen, consider this, all of you. Think about this. 
you're going to spend the money for a meal. Look and see how it's dressed. If that meal that you're looking at is you're going to buy it, you see that picture, there's no breaching. Wait a minute. We got a problem. There's no rear cinch. Wait a minute. We got a problem. Look and see where that saddle is. Look and see where that front cinch is. Uh, Dell Williamson out of Texas, he bought a mule and it got bucked off twice. Mm -hmm. And finally, he found a veterinarian that knew what he was doing and took a picture of the scapula. And the scapula had a piece had, had a piece about this big that looked like cauliflower that was on that scapula. Folks, listen, if you're going to spend that kind of money uh, on Jake, like on Jake Clark's sales, they got quality mules there and quality trainers and this sort of thing. They do. But I want you to think about this. Are they riding the animal right or are they riding it like a horse? If there's no breaching on that animal or if there's a crouper on that animal, consider you may be buying future problems. And always, always, everybody, taking to vet checks, especially on the scapula, have them shoot pictures of that. Uh, what, what you don't see is when people take the saddles off and you see all these white marks around there, which you will see. But look at that. If this mule has truly been trained up to spar, he should, within a 10-foot circle, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters, side pass. Within a 10-foot circle, pick up all four feet. Within a 10-foot circle, stand still and quiet while you've been brushing them, and this sort of thing. But remember, if that cinch is sitting up underneath the front legs, if there's no breaching on there, it's not going to be good physically for that mule. So, um, yes, very good, great points. Um, and uh, and if there's ever a, a, you want Steve to take a look at a mule that you're looking at, just send him a text message. He'll tell you what he thinks. He'll he'll give you all the information he can think of, and then he'll say, "Now you've got the information. Go ahead and and." You know, take that for what it's worth. Um, so, yeah, very good. That's a question we get quite a bit is if Steve can help pair people up with mules. And we stay out of that process, but Steve yeah. is always willing to take a look at a picture and just say, hey, here's a couple things you're going to want to consider. Kathleen says, love you boys. Thank you, Kathleen. You're making us blush. Can you recommend a video or episode on riding for the first time? I think Steve can, especially if one wants to buy a saddle. And I like this right here. She says, speaking of which... Is there a Lego version of your saddle that you sell for packing, and then maybe you can ride later? And I'll tell you right there, Kathleen, they're completely different in the way they're designed, and you wouldn't want a Lego version, and your mule wouldn't want a Lego version. So you want to have your pack saddle, and, and Steve's pack saddle is the first saddle he designed, uh, and they have the floating bars, and there's some great videos. I'll put a link in the comment section. Uh, you'll be amazed at just how simple and makes sense it is and then you've got your second one for the riding saddle um, and you want those to be different but Steve what would you recommend on somebody who's ready to do who's wanting to look towards doing their first ride because if you don't have control on the ground you don't have control in the saddle so what would you want Kathleen to do to make sure that first ride is as much of a success as possible well of course ground communication is the very best uh, my my uh, video set uh, of uh, the uh, cold starting, everybody there, there's five people. It's the first time they've ever ridden that particular mule. None of them are trainers. Most of them are pretty much beginning beginner riders. And you'll see every one of them see the first rides all the way through. And I think we got a bonus video in there, a bonus video too, that we send in. Uh, with uh, some first riding techniques and this sort of thing. But you'll see in there, none of those mules, uh, you'll see them not making mistakes. They just go right through the process and everything works pretty good. Yeah, one of the things you're going to notice as you watch Steve's videos, and this is actually on purpose, this is uh, intentional, is you're going to see the same thing taught. You know, each video is a different topic, but you're going to hear a lot of the same things taught from a different angle. So if we're talking about ground communication, you're going to hear ask, tell, demand. Then we move and we're talking about communicating from the saddle, you're still going to hear ask, tell, demand. You're going to hear a lot of the same communication principles and basics. And the reason why that's a positive thing is because you're going to hear it from side A one time and you're just 
in one ear, out the other. That's how life goes. But then you're going to hear it two or three more times. And by the time you heard it the fourth time, you're going to think, that's what he was talking about. And so we really work hard to emphasize these training techniques across all different you know, topics of training because they really do work. And sometimes it just takes hearing it uh, several times in re repetition. So uh, the, cult, the foundation cult starting um, here is the foundation cult starting. Uh, really great videos. Uh, you can get those as DVDs or you can get them as digital videos. Uh, the digital videos come right away. The DVDs come in a few days. Uh, but it's a really great set uh, and you'll you'll really enjoy the content there, especially because it's such a wide variety of uh, folks that are involved in the training here. Okay, let's hop back over. It's four o'clock. Let's try and get through the rest of these questions. Oh, my. Uh, Nina sent a message, says, My Jenny had a jack six weeks ago. Congratulations. He is so sweet, I'll bet. I've been training him to pick up his feet so that when the guy comes to trim their feet, he will be easy to do. I noticed a few ticks he has picked up under his belly and for legs uh, and uh, for the legs I've removed. Uh, I put gasoline to rub on them for easy removal. Is there anything I can get to keep the ticks away? We mow the field every now and then, now and then, keeping the weeds down. So that will help. What a darling he is! So friendly. He knows us now. Been bonding with him since he was born. Will he bray when he gets older? Uh, he hears Mama bray. So what would you say to Nina? Oh yeah, he's he definitely going to bray. You may get tired of it too. Ticks are a bugger when you go back uh, east. They're really a booger. I was trying to think, Dave, of the name of that product. I mean, oh, you get yeah. a hold of her, of that product that uh, has, it's really good for for flies and this sort of thing. And and I've used WD-40 in the past, and I, and I still do use it. I'll take and spray it on a cloth, and then I'll rub it on their bellies and stuff uh, for the flies. Uh, but there's that one product that's all natural, and I, I can't think of the name of it. It starts with an S, it seems like. Um, I need to find that, and we need to get in contact with her, because that stuff really worked well uh, for a lot of my clients. Um, what was that? Uh, anyway, we've it, we've it, said it so many times. I, I'll yeah. ask. Uh, I have a I have a uh, one of my teammates who goes through all these videos. Matter of fact, folks. If you have not watched the replays on these videos, let me tell you, you are missing out. If you go to the YouTube channel, just type in Queen Valley Mule Ranch on YouTube.com, you'll find Steve's channel. There is a playlist in there called Ask Steve. Every single video is in there, and we go one better for you. Get this. We put the timestamp in the description below so if you expand the description you'll see a list of every single thing that we talk about just click on the minute marker so if it says Steve and Dave talked about fly spray at 432 just click on 432 and it'll load that marker up in the window so you don't have to watch the whole thing to get to the topic you just click and it goes but wow. we've talked about that uh, one of one of my teammates uh, Elizabeth she watch she loves she works for me she watches every single video that we do and she writes up descriptions and everything so that folks can find what they're looking for she loves it steve she goes when are you guys going to start doing the shows again because i really loved watching those so elizabeth if you're watching this can you tell me can you find which video we talk about that fly spray and uh, and we'll get it we'll mark it we'll contact her we'll see if we can yeah. get it on the store and if we can't get it on the store we'll link to it from the store so we'll take care of it one way or another steve yeah, you know, I think I've got some of that in over here in the storage room. I'm going to go have a look see. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, got a question here about bits now. We always seem to get, I don't think we really talked about it much here today, but we almost always get a question about bits. Jessica says, I have questions about the difference between the Martingale head, Martingale head stall bits and reins and how the bit compares to a twisted snaffle bit. It looks like maybe it's a double twisted snaffle. I imagine there is a difference. Otherwise, you wouldn't sell it. I'm just trying to understand the system before I buy it, as I already have a system, and I'm trying to determine if I need to switch. So she's looking at the Martingale, headstall, reins, bits, bridles. Steve, just give us a quick, Jessica, here's what you need to know. Well, the double twisted wire snaffle bit is the easiest bit in the world for building a good foundation on a mule and donkey. The problem with the smooth snaffle bit, especially with horsemen, they're used to putting more pressure onto the bit. 
I have seen more cut tongues from a smooth snaffle bit than I have from any one bit out there. Now, the double twisted wire, I think we got some video even, Dave, uh, where we did some demonstration. Maybe we could send her and they could see. I have a person, a little girl, hold on to the bit. And you can see me barely moving my hands and getting super results with it. The thing with the martingale is I spent a lot of years trying to figure out what width of straps, what type of string, what type of bit, the lengths of the of the reins, the weight of the reins. I spent a lot of time figuring it out. And I finally came up with this beta. I've used all kinds of leather, different size, different weights. I've used uh, nylon reins. I've used uh, uh, nylon head stalls. Anyway, I've used all kinds of stuff. And I finally come down to my favorite tool, the Mule Riders Martingale. Uh, and it's, and it's, it's wonderful. It keeps the framed up and balanced of the animal. It's not like a tie down. It's not like a training fork. It's not like a German Martingale. It has a lot of similarities with it, but the big thing is it's made for the mule. It's got a 19 inch brow band. Uh, the balance of the head stall balances the bit and that's really important folks buy head stalls because they're pretty folks that's not what the head stall is supposed to be it's supposed to be to be working part of that bit you're going to use a snaffle bit head stall you're going to use a finished bit head stall they're completely separate awesome very good i put a link in the comment section and i sent a message back uh, just with the article that we've got, it's mule and donkey bits, everything that you need to know, folks. We cover everything in there. And uh, when you get done going through and reading that, you'll have a really good command on what bit and why. And really, that's what it comes down to. Uh, Trisha sent in an email, says, I really enjoyed the nutrition video, which she's talking about a feed talk video. I'll put a link in the comment section. It's free, and it's all about creating a feed and nutrition program for your animal. Again, much of the same applies to dog nutrition. I have looked and there is no lichen distributor in this area. My question is, most equine people in Alaska adhere to the idea that they need to feed hay throughout the day in the winter to produce body heat to keep the animal warm. Is this true? Seems to me it would be wise to still feed a balanced pellet diet and supplement with hay and straw. My concern is, but then my concern is uh, getting a winter weight obese donkey. What would you say to this specific concern that Trish has got? Well, the nice, you're right. It, you, you cannot buy Lake and Light other than in, in California, parts of Colorado, parts of New Mexico, and of course, Arizona. Take the ingredients that's in the article, Mule Scan Stand Prosperity. Take the ingredients, go down to your feed store. What do you have similar to this? Now, they basically, you are right. Feeding hay is the best way to keep up heat and energy in your animals, not grains. Grains are going to put fat on them, which is going to create some problems with your donkey, which already has problems with, with the carbohydrates. So uh, uh, take that ingredients, use that article, and that'll help you out a lot. All right, so I'm putting a link in the comments section uh, to Mules Can't Stand Prosperity. Folks, you all need to check this out. This is a feed article, so I'll put that in there. And then I'll put a link to the uh, feed video, which is something that y'all are going to want to take a look at too. Both of those are free, uh, super helpful. Anybody that's read it will tell you that it's incredibly informative and they were better for having gone through it. All right, let's make sure we hit all of our final questions. I've, I've neglected YouTube a little bit. I apologize, my YouTube friends. It was not intentional. Uh, let's hop over here real quick. Uh, Kimberly says, Wyatt has had hay and pellets 24-7 for this first year. Um, at what point should I start rationing his portions? So I think we're talking a young animal. I can't remember how old she said why it is, but yeah, usually, usually I'll, I think that's the one here in Gilbert, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Anyway, uh, usually when they're two years old, I'll start kind of, I, I won't just have feet in front of them all the time. Um, and, and I start training on them. Uh, they need, they need feed, uh, on them so it just really depends on how they do uh, I, I am hesitant to say to you don't feed any grain only feed grain when you're training and only feed whole oats but uh, usually those colts need to 
between eight and ten pounds a day of feeding. Uh, and, and, and that's a nice thing you can do too, is you can feed them in intervals. So you can feed like three times a day or four times a day, uh, just so they'll, but not have feed in front of them all the time. Usually what I'll do is I'll take one out, I'll train on him a little bit, I'll put him back in his pen, I'll take another one out and get him ready, and then I'll go back and give him some hay so that he'll have something to eat on, or I may even uh, give him some grain to prepare him for the next session that we'll be doing. But you know, you can also break it up and do feed three or four times a day as well. There's so many questions about feed and nutrition, and I just applaud anybody that's trying to do it right um, and really learn because one of the things you will discover is that that program needs to be different and unique for every single animal because uh, no two animals are the same. They might be similar, uh, but one of the things that you'll hear Steve talking about when it comes to feed is do not let them out to pasture for two reasons. They can't stand prosperity, and you will not be able to measure how much of what they're getting. So when you keep them in their pen, what do you, what do, you do, Steve? 10 by 20? 10 by 20? Yeah, 10 pen? by 20 is my favorite stall. Yeah. 10 by 20 stall. Uh, not only are you preventing them from having unlimited feed and as great as it is to have free feed uh, it's even better to have a healthy animal and so uh, not only do you know exactly how much they're getting but you know exactly what they're getting and so that's why we look at the pellets uh, because you know exactly what vitamins and minerals uh, they're getting and what you need to supplement with as far as feeding according to use. So really good questions about feed there. Um, Red Eagle's asking about the ultralight. We are so close to having that online. Red Eagle, call Steve, 602-999-6853. He will give you all of the details exclusively for you and uh, and get you with everything that you need. And he just clarified, Abner's a mule and not a donkey. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. Sabra says, thanks for the links. Steve, why do you say whole oats? I use combo rolled oats and sweet feed with all the hay they like. Okay. Sabra Sandy. Good question. Steve, tell her why. We talked about this last week. She's going to appreciate yeah. knowing why. Yeah. Sweet feed is, again, it's a carbohydrate. We don't need to give your meal a bunch of things that's going to cripple them. Uh, that's going to create more problems with the fat pockets and stuff. I feed whole oats because it is not a fattening agent. Whole oats gives them energy. When you feel feeding a, a crimped oat with sweet feed, that's carbohydrates that these mules don't need. Number one, it can make a lot of these mules be flat monsters. They can look for monsters everywhere up and down the trail. But the biggest thing is it's not good because it's got too many carbohydrates and it'll build into the fat pockets and you can end up getting grass founder. Yep, not a pretty thing getting that no. grass founder. Uh, let's see, Linda says, let's wrap up here. Linda says, I don't have a surcingle. Can I do groundwork on Theo with the trail light saddle on and the come along rope or halter? Yes, you can, you know, uh, you can take, some people take, myself included, I'll take and put two come along ropes onto the halter and uh, and and uh, put the saddle on and walk behind them. Now, that's something I haven't done a lot of. I have done it. I have had my apprentices do it. The big problem with that is this. You end up pulling on the animals too much. So, you know, that's the problem is you got a lot of leverage on that come along and you got a good chance of, of making them stiff on you. So I just use, you can just use the, uh, the saddle with the breaching and taking place of the surcingle and tie the halter to the horn with some baling twine and you got it. Very good. Um, so we're so close to the end here. Uh, Marnie uh, says, when I purchased my mule, so, okay, this is a good one, Steve. When I purchased my mule, I got a package deal. All his tack, truck, trailer, or truck trailer, not the truck and trailer, truck trailer and everything. His saddle is an endurance saddle. Came with a britching. It has a matching set, but it doesn't have a rear cinch. We also do search and rescue. Could you elaborate on the rear cinch, please? The rear cinch is the most important part of your saddle. Your breaching does not hold the saddle back. Okay, what holds the saddle back is the breech is the rear cinch. Why is that? The mules are V-shaped in their shoulders. They carry their weight down low. 
their hourglass belly toward their shoulders. So a front cinch is always at an angle. What's it doing? It's going to be pulling the saddle forward. When the breeching says, don't go forward, forward no more, but the saddle says, I'm going to go forward, and that cinch will pull the saddle forward. And that's because of the hourglass belly of the, of the mule. And then if you're using a horse breast collar on top of that, you're going to have that saddle go forward and bang it on that scapula. Now, test me on this. Try this. Put the mule out and, and, and first set the saddle back an inch and a half behind the scapula, set it all up, and then slide your hand up underneath there and turn the head towards you and see if it doesn't pinch your hand. And then go right for 15 minutes and come back. You're not going to be able to get your hand between the scapula and the saddle because the rear cinch is not there and the front cinch is pulling the saddle forward. Very good. Some good basics there. Um, yeah, rear cinch, we get a lot of questions about that. A lot of folks don't have a spot for a rear cinch on their saddle and they are very uh, shocked to find out that that is the most important cinch when it comes to when it comes to fitting up your saddle for the unique animal that you have. So glad that you asked that question there, uh, Marnie. Uh, really has some encouraging words here from Michael. Michael says, "This is uh, that's awesome. I shared the feed video. Uh, have changed our Mustangs over to total equine pellets and I have it on my list to watch the feed video. Um, he, uh, let's see. Uh, Kevin Sparks is watching, 82 degrees, sunny in Kansas. Glad that you're here, Kevin. Um, making sure that we got everybody here. I think, I think we got it all. Marnie says, awesome. good to know. Let me check YouTube. Um, David Walls tuned in. David, hopefully you got to catch a couple of it. We've just wrapped up. We've gotten done, gotten through all of our questions, um, gotten through all of our conversation. Thank you to everybody who shared just what animal you're riding with Steve's saddle. So earlier we had a question from uh, one of our uh, one of our friends named Laura, and she said, "Will your saddle fit any size?" And one thing we've never done is ask folks to share, "Do you have a Steve Edwards saddle, and what size mule are you riding?" And we got, I mean, just here, 13, 14, 14 and a half, 15, 17. Um, Pretty cool. So if you're still watching and you want to join in, you're riding in a Steve Edwards saddle, go ahead and put in the comments section what size animal you're riding, and uh, we'll just let folks know that they can really trust. It's not us saying it. It is you sharing what animal you've got and the saddle that you're riding. So put what saddle you're riding and what size your animal is, and that'll be a lot of fun for folks to check out. Steve, how is the fire fighting business going firefighting uh adventures going everything everything under control right now it was a little pretty touch and go done. there last week yeah pretty much done we, we 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 took all the equipment down yesterday we took it down the station and we washed it and cleaned it and got ready for the next fire we're probably going to have this is our this is our fire season it's up and coming uh, we don't have a lot of building fires out here in the in the in the desert we have a lot of wildfires, and yeah, it's got to be fought completely different. And uh, so we, we use a lot of helicopters, a lot of planes. But long story short, we saved a ranch. We kept it from being burned to the ground. Yeah. And the rancher is very, very uh, uh, thankful for that, of course. And sure. it just happened to be right uh, to the west of where we had our big fire last year. That was $25 million in almost two and a half months. Mm. Uh, so we were able to get it nipped in the bud in a seven to nine days. Lots of firefighters from all over Arizona, uh, Flagstaff from Tucson, from Mesa, from uh, Payson. They hot shots come from everywhere, and uh, to, it was something to see those big planes come down and dump. But we yeah. saved the ranch. Uh, we did burn off a lot of brush that needed to get burned, which was nice, and. Uh, and it was pretty incredible. But I appreciate all the, all the thoughts and prayers of people that, uh, that have called in, emailed, and texted, and this sort of thing. There's a sign down by the fire department of the locals, and they all got a big sign that says, Thank you, uh, brave firefighters, for being there for us. You know? oh, so, cool. Yeah, it, it's, it's great, Dave. Very uh, cool. Yeah. 
Um, let's see here. Real quick, Kevin Sparks says a 16-3 Foxtrotter Mule and Steve's 16-inch Packer Saddle. And Jack says 15 hands high mule, slender build, Molly, about 850 pounds is the mule he's riding on with one of your saddles. So very cool yeah. there. Thank you, gentlemen. That's Appreciate great. that. Uh, folks, we're plan Steve and I are planning on getting out to film some uh, to film some videos. Just a few of the videos uh, that I've got on my list is uh, some stuff about cinches. I've got some stuff about mule riders martingale. Uh, I've got some demonstrations I want Steve to show me about uh, lunging. And if not lunging, then what do we do instead? And then lateral flexions. And if we're not going to do lateral flexions, what do we do instead? Uh, made some notes from today. Lope, canter. We'll get some good videos. We'll start loading them up on YouTube. We'll make sure that you guys are getting results when you get out there and train. And uh, the only thing that we ask in return is that if you know somebody who's trying to get results too, Send them our way. Send them to muleranch.com, and we will take care of them. We will make you proud to have sent them uh, our way. Thanks, everybody, for watching this week. Really appreciate your time. Uh, we don't Absolutely. take it for granted, and we look forward to spending some time with you next week as well. Take care, everybody. See ya. Hey, thanks a lot, Dave. I appreciate your time, buddy. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Bye-bye, everyone.